Everything in this video is not intended as financial or investment advice and is for educational purposes only. I'm Josh Rolls, which is the head of research at Valkyrie. Let's take a look at the midweek market update. So the merge is this week, likely Thursday morning, early morning EST. I believe that is between 1 and 2 a.m. EST. Just as a brief overview, Ethereum is moving from proof of work, which is miners, to proof of stake on creating validators through supply or using supply as stake to create a validator. And the validators then have consensus control over the network. And the biggest change here, other than consensus, which is just the biggest thing you can change about anything, is the issuance, which is going to decline significantly from approximately 4% to potentially zero or less. This could potentially get deflationary should on-chain activity pick up significantly because there is a burning mechanism with the fees. It's complex. It's definitely different than Bitcoin in that Bitcoin is a very specific monetary policy that will not change ever. People have tried. Other forks have happened. They've all failed. It's not going to happen. Then Bitcoin will never go proof of stake. Bitcoin will never adjust its monetary pol policy. That's its strength. So the difference here, as you can see, the, the block rewards have changed over time. And not only is the stake for validators locked, but so is the rewards. So are the rewards. Until at least 6 to 12 months after the merge, the code to unlock those tokens hasn't even been written yet. So it might even be longer than 6 to 12 months until those rewards and those validators are locked up. So it is incredibly important to pay attention to the number of validators in the network because it is a one-way street right now. You, can unlo you cannot unlock that. So if validators are rising, if on-chain transactions are rising, and prices divergent from that, you could say, okay, well, there's maybe a bullish divergence here. We're not quite seeing that yet, but once this goes proof of stake, we'll see if things change. Additionally, with the merge, there is a competing fork called ETHW that will effectively be an airdrop to anybody holding ETH at the time of the snapshot of the merge, depending on when they do this. The details are incredibly non-specific, let's just say, and changing. You know, they say this will happen within 24 hours of the merge. They have to wait until 2,000 blocks. I think that's about five minutes because there are issues with how this transition is going to happen. They have to snapshot some hash rate. It's going to be a giant mess, but the, the long and the short, short of it is don't expect to be able to move your fork anytime soon. Don't expect any exchange to list it immediately that hasn't already announced listing you know, we may have some exchanges listing this down the road, potentially. Coinbase, Kraken, other U.S. exchanges. There are some Asian exchanges that are already listing this, BitMEX, Bitfinex. But for the most part, the U.S. exchanges are staying away from this for the moment. That may change. The reason everyone's so focused on this is because it can and will have a value that is effectively free money for people involved here holding on to ETH at the time of the merge. This isn't the first fork. This isn't the first airdrop. In general, how these things work, people acquire them, they move them to an exchange, and they sell them immediately. This has happened since the inception of time. I do not expect this to be any different. Unfortunately, you're going to find people who confuse this ticker with ETH and are buying this and thinking they're getting a discount on ETH massively. So it has to be incredibly clear that this is not ETH. This version of ETH will not have DeFi, does not have the community. This version of ETH is basically miners, has no developers as far as I can tell, maybe a few, and is a giant circus. So keep that in mind. This is on Poloniex. They listed the chain split token ahead of time um, just to allow people to find a market for it. So if you're curious and want to watch what's going on, I would pay attention to uh, this ticker ETHWUSD. In this case, it's USDT, but whatever, you know, wherever you can find it. Uh, Bitfinex is another place. This is from TradingView. And the other ticker that historically, it's always important to watch in regards to forks or airdrops or chain splits is the direct pair ticker. So ETH, W, ETH is what you're looking for if you want to watch this. 
play out in real time. And more likely than not, this will eventually be worth zero. For many people, this represents a giant cash grab by miners trying to hold on to their profit, which, hey, it's understandable that they were making buku bucks for months and all that's gone now. So they want to stay in the game. And just to show why miners are putting up a fight, this is the historical miner revenue daily. You can see it topped 125 million and is still almost a million a day. So this is what miners are losing out on when ETH goes to proof of stake and is a large impetus for creating ETHW. Now they will say this is because we think the chain is going to be centralized, the new ETH, ETH proof of stake. We think the chain is captured. All of these things may be true, but ultimately stable coins, DeFi, community developers, they're all moving to proof of stake. And again, we can look to previous forks. This is Bitcoin against Bitcoin Cash. It's not pretty. It's never pretty. It may be noisy and volatile in the beginning. You may see a lot of PR or articles about it in the press, but it is very unlikely that ETHW will succeed how ETH has. So keep that in mind. Is it tradable? Will people trade it? Sure. But th this is purely speculative and ultimately has very little fundamental value. You know, you will see some sort of stable coin try to get spun up on it, some sort of DeFi ecosystem. You'll see all this stuff to give the illusion that it has a chance but ultimately it is very unlikely. Um, this is ETC against ETH. ETC split from ETH in 2016 after the DAO hack rollback. And these forks generally only have one direction and that's down. Not investment advice, but something to keep in mind. Now, a lot of people have been paying attention to ETC ETH because for them, that is a hedge potentially for ETH proof of stake, not doing as well as everyone has hoped. I doubt that uh, even ETC can dethrone ETH because, again, the community, the developers, DeFi, stablecoins, the whole ecosystem is ETH. If ETH has a hiccup or has an error, they will fix it on that chain. They're not going to just suddenly throw up their hands and migrate to ETC or ETHW. It's just not going to happen ever. All this is just hedging and speculation. There's just no activity on ETC. On-chain activity is minimal. And it's just persisted much like BCH has over the years because it is listed and then it gets spun up in indices and institutional products when ultimately there just isn't any fundamental value. And it's been a very volatile week in markets, specifically TradFi. This was the 12th of September. Wall Street Report posts four straight days of gains ahead of CPI report. Many people, including myself, were under the assumption that CPI would actually come in as surveyed, which is down month over month. And that certainly did not happen. It came in 0.1% above the previous month. So CPI anyway, still rising. I'm not going to get into the breakdown of core or food or healthcare, whatever, whatever it was. The point is the algos, the people were very angry with this number, very upset. And we get this headline the next day, you know, September 13th, Wall Street, biggest plunge. So risk assets right now, just really going through the ringer. Tons of fear, tons of reactionary behavior to data points because there's this assumption that should CPI finally cool off, the Fed may be less hawkish and the hiking regime may end sooner rather than later. As CPI stays elevated, that gives the opposite signal that the Fed will need to hike more or for longer. And another metric to show how angry markets were, every single stock in the NASDAQ composite fell today. First time that's happened since March 2020, which was COVID, obviously. So just a very, very red day all around, including crypto. And now we're even seeing probabilities for rate hikes up to 100 basis points. This is next FOMC next week. So the Fed may feel as though they need to hike even further because inflation's still not coming down. And I think reading between the lines, many people are saying no matter what the Fed does with rates, no matter what kind of demand destruction happens, inflation is likely to persist and not be transitory for a significant period of time. And we may just have to live with higher than 2% inflation, regardless of rates.
the other reading between the lines of these ceilings of rates is that the assumption we cannot raise past four, past five, because of our own debt burden, our own debt payments on, on that interest. So we'll see what the Fed has to say next week about all of this, but you can't ignore it in crypto land, in digital asset land, because it is certainly driving everything right now. The meeting after next is the week of midterms in the US, and we'll see if we get any forward guidance out of Powell next week in regard to that meeting. Um, but that leaves the opportunity for a decent setup in October where we may get a CPI print that actually starts to quiet down into the meeting a few weeks after, right? But the market's clearly under the assumption that CPI still rising, Fed still hawkish, rates still rising, don't fight the Fed, right? That's what this comes down to. So a lot of interesting TradFi data points leaking into crypto here. Looking at some on-chain activity here, this is stablecoin circulating supply of Tether USDC BUSD and DAI, DAI, Maker DAO's stablecoin. And you can see that Tether is basically leveled off. They're continuing to clean up their books, become more transparent, hopefully starting to release a month over month change of reserves from an actual auditor. Great, awesome. USDC had a chance at overtaking Tether in the circulating supply realm, um, but that Tornado Cash stuff really spooked a lot of people, I think. And that's what you're seeing. USDC come off here. USDC rates right now on Circle are also 0.5%, which doesn't help their case for additional mints here. But the bottom line with all this stuff is we're not seeing all of the air get sucked out of the room in regards to stable coins. We still have a significant amount sitting in the ecosystem waiting to do stuff, right? Whether that be yield or buy risk assets or whatever, it's still in DeFi, it's still on exchanges, it hasn't gone anywhere. And if anything, BUSD continues to rise. Now they announced last week or the week before that they were converting all stable coins on the platform, barring Tether into BUSD. So I think that's feeling some of this rise here to all-time highs in circulating supply for BUSD. But generally speaking, still plenty of stable coin, plenty of dry powder sitting in the pipes here. Looking at BTC's on-chain activity, really since the beginning of the year, in general, the trend has been neutral, flat, slightly down, week over week. Now this is monthly averages here, but it makes sense considering prices sideways, momentum is sideways. In general, when you see rising prices, you typically see rising on-chain activity and vice versa. So it's no surprise. In that regard, ETH as well, a larger range, but essentially flat since really the beginning of 2021 when on-chain activity peaked. Now between the 2021 high at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, there was clearly a divergence here in on-chain activity, which is a big signal in general that there's a bearish divergence between price and on-chain activity. And that's not generally a trade that I want to be on the side of if prices are rising and on-chain activity is declining. So it's good that some of that on-chain activity is resetting now. It is declining heavily on ETH. And at this point, even in the order book side of things for ETH, it looks like most of the institutional volume is just waiting for the merge, waiting to make sure everything goes well before doing anything drastic as far as allocation is concerned, which makes sense. It's a big potential event where something could happen to the chain and you don't want to be stuck dealing with issues there. But ultimately, I, I don't think anybody expects anything to go drastically wrong with ETH itself. So post-merge, we'll see what these indicators look like weeks and months following, but I expect them to look vastly different because the chain itself is just different in makeup. And you may see on-chain activity double, triple. Um, and again, you have to know it was proof of work. It's now proof of stake. You're going to see all these headlines and tweets about ETH's on-chain activities so much better now. Somewhat true, but it's like comparing apples and oranges. It's It's different, you know, but that will change the network drastically. Uh, BTC and ETH on exchanges, again, flat down. Nothing too crazy here. We're not seeing massive rises in either coin sitting on exchanges, mainly just flat here. But again, I, I wouldn't want to trade a divergence or be on the opposite side of that. If we're seeing prices rise into rising deposits, prices fall into falling deposits, generally means that BTC or ETH are being sent to other means outside of speculation if these numbers are falling. 
And one thing to watch as well, post-merge is ETH 2.0 validators, because again, these are locked for at least six to 12 months. That's estimated. There's no hard date. Nobody knows when this stuff's going to actually be unlocked until the code is written and reviewed. So this just represents more and more ETH that is temporarily locked, which for price, you'd think eventually would kick in should demand increase. And even recently, we're seeing a rise in this is validators per day, new validators per day. These are early adopters back here. This was some Luna stuff in here when Lido allowed you to, to use your staked ETH in Anchor. And now this activity here is probably related to the checkpoints closer and closer to the merge. There's more and more confidence that it's going to happen and be successful. And as far as drawdowns from all-time high, this is really within the realm of what's happened historically, both for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, for Bitcoin, the lows typically come in at around 80% as far as drawdowns are concerned. We are at 70 right now, 72, certainly within what's happened. Uh, COVID low is 73% drawdown. So obviously to a TradFi investor, that is insanity uh, to see that over and over again, to see these boom bust cycles over and over again. It's one reason for a risk managed approach rather than uh, a buy and hold, even though buy and hold over time has done fine, obviously, right? We're talking about prices from sub $500 in 2015 to today, 20,000. But I'm still not concerned about uh, these drawdowns. ETH has it been even deeper. This is a 90% plus drawdown, 93%, I think, at the peak. Currently, peak is around 80, sitting somewhere now around 65% drawdown from all-time high. So as extreme as it sounds, not unusual. Now, previously, this was uh, ICO driven as far as 2017. This was all uh, kind of regulatory arbit arbitrage type stuff, pushing this higher. And then after that, essentially it was just ICO treasuries unwinding nonstop. And what got ETH out of the doldrums along with Bitcoin was uh, DeFi activity or on-chain activity, right? So that's one thing to watch for going forward for BTC or ETH, if it's Bitcoin's lightning activity, if it's ETH's DeFi activity, NFT activity, if it's bridges, if it's interoperability, if it's GameFi, if it's Metaverse, if it's any of that stuff, it doesn't really matter what it is, but that's why we pay attention to on-chain activity week over week to see what's going on there. Moving on to some technicals just really quickly. Not much has changed for Bitcoin week over week. Just super volatile. Still trying to get out of this gravitational pull of this downward channel here. Attempting to retest the 200 weeks, still flirting with a breakdown below the 2017 all time high. It makes sense to me that we're consolidating in this area. There's definitely a fight between buying this and selling this uh, in the market. And you're seeing that play out with this extended consolidation. Chart pattern wise, this doesn't look like anything in particular. This could end up being a deletable bottom. It could be an Adam Eve or Eve Adam, depending on how you want to think about that. Um, but this hasn't set up yet for a broader bottom type fractal or bottom type chart pattern. It's just more and more day by day looking like a random walk down here. And ETH as well, you know, it's had a series of these chart patterns. It, it's had a series of these consolidation periods. And as it stands here, nothing really that I'm aware of stands out to me on this time frame anyway. ETH still within that downward channel. Above the previous all-time high, above the 200-week MA, but below the 200-day moving average. So definitely th something to watch here post-merge is, does ETH or BTC catch a bid? If ETH catches a bid, does it outperform BTC in a big way, or does it drag BTC with it to the, to the top side, right? Do we see validators coming online post-merge, and do we see ETHW doing anything at all? You know, one thing additionally that we may see is people selling their ETHW for ETH, uh, which helps the ETH price obviously even more. And uh, not investment advice, but it's something I would, I would encourage people to do. <laughs> sell the fork, right? Vote with your dollars, vote with your feet. Uh, sell the nonsense fork if you're able to and uh, do some good with that money donated to a charity. 
uh, it is a taxable event. So <laughs> keep that in mind. That's all I have for this one. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.